This is Think Like a Genius. Tread the line of cognitive psychology, neuroscience, persuasion, and so much more than gray matter. Let's dive in as we fall into a world of intrigue. Rich, good morning. Um, thank you very much for taking the time for being on the uh, podcast interview. Uh, just to give people a bit of uh, background, uh, you did a post on Facebook with regards to fight or flight uh, kind of reaction or response uh, that people are, uh, you could say, exposed to on, a, uh, on either emergency situation but also on a daily basis. Uh, I've got a mm -hmm. really strong interest in it because of how it actually affects uh, thinking and brain processes. Yeah. So I wanted to actually explore your experience with actually training the fight or flight response, but also just to provide people with a bit of background of how the, you could say, the physical uh, processes work within the body. And then I'd like to explore how your fight or flight training actually conditions that your behavior to actually manage that. So to give yeah. people a, okay. bit of, a bit of background, um, can you tell us a bit your background and also what you what you do at the moment? Okay, yeah, fantastic. Well, thanks for having us on the on the podcast. So my background is um, I've been a, in the military uh, for twenty one years. Um, I've been a pilot throughout that that time, so a, both a helicopter pilot and a fast jet pilot. Firstly, starting out in what was known as the commando helicopter role. So that was a a role that was to transport, um, you know what are called tier one troops or potential special forces troops to the front line of combat. Now, when I finished training, I w that was in 2003. So I came out of training and went immediately to Iraq, which was the, the declaration of a war which, uh, against Iraq, which was uh, April 2003. So went straight into that era of, of kind of war fighting, shall we say. And that lasted a number of years. So I was a helicopter pilot then. I flew search and rescue um, helicopters off the west coast of Scotland following five years on the front line with Command and Helicopter Force. Search and rescue off the, off the west coast of um, Scotland, you never knew what you were going to see. Day in, day out, every situation was genuinely different. And I did that through until 2009, at which point I moved from helicopter flying into fast jet flying. Um, and I flew uh, jets for the Royal Air Force from 2009 until effectively my retirement this year. So my entire um, should we say adult life, my career following university, what has been in the military uh, and very drilled in, in that disciplined um, disciplined training, which we're especially, and even more disciplined because it was uh, flying training. Mm. Following that, or, or coupled alongside of that throughout, I've been uh, involved in the property industry, uh, involved in um, developing properties from uh, single units or single houses all the way up to blocks of flats, the largest being a block of 16 flats, which has been developed and built. Uh, so I've done that couple, ran alongside my military career. And now as I leave and transition outside of the military, I'll be doing that full time now. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've done quite a lot on the, shall we say, on the edge of human performance. Um, I've done a lot of sports, which are classed as on the edge of human performance as well, um, really. And because I was quite interested about as well about how my body would react, um, having seen a number of situations. So that's kind of my background, my history, um, career-wise. Um, and really, I'd like we'll, we'll see where it, see where it goes now, and how, yeah, see if I'm still, um, shall we say, challenged in the same way I have been for the past twenty-one years mm. in the military. Okay. Mm. Now the topic of fight or flight, um, mm. I'll. I'll provide some uh, background because you also mentioned something else which I'm quite interested in, which is high performance. I don't know if you've read uh, The Rise of Superman by Stephen Kotler. No, I haven't, no. Fantastic book. Really, really good book. He's done a follow-up called uh, what's it, Stealing Fire. Yeah. But it's also about high performance and how the brain functions and that. And there's a lot of research in, in high performance to actually get to that, you could say, flow state, which people call it. So it's a lot of people are familiar with the term uh, being in the zone. And I think a lot of pilots yes. in high stress uh, situations will actually get into that situation because it triggers a number of flow conditions, which means high stress conditions, very challenging, requiring a lot of focus. 
and being really present uh, in, in that period of time. You can't be focusing on, you know, a bunch of other stuff. You've got to be really present when you do 100%. it. Yeah, yeah. So it, it activates a bunch of brain processes, especially high performance brain processes. So I don't want to dive into that as yet because that's another in-depth conversation. Yeah. The main thing I want to talk about is a fight or flight. Now, the fight or flight uh, response works on the amygdala, which you are very much aware of. And it basically what it does is the brain processes information in two ways. Uh, when you do it on your normal cognitive way, which is your analytical thinking, it use, it use the front part of your brain. Mm -hmm. When you get into an emergency situation, it basically bypasses the front part of the brain and actually directly goes to your amygdala, which deals with your fear responses. Okay. And those yeah, fear yeah. responses are the other things which it triggers, which is increased heart rate, faster breathing. It triggers a bunch of hormonal um, processes known as the HPA axis, which is in more in depth, which I won't go into. But that whole process then also um, speeds up your physiological response to basi basically deal with a, uh, a fear or a danger scenario. Yeah, which is why fight or flight tends to work a lot on visual um, responses or any kind of audio recognition, which could trigger a um, a warning scenario. Some warning scenario. Sometimes the warning scenarios can be anything from a previous experience, which was bad. Let's say a fire or something like that. You're very conditioned to that, or something that people will recognize is a rattlesnake sound because it's very yeah. recognizable. That's immediately a danger signal, which then triggers a flight or fight uh, response because the first thing yeah. you do is then you start looking for the danger and then yeah. your, your, your whole physiological response goes according to that. Now that whole process um, works because it's linked to your, uh, your heart, your lungs and your, your uh, uh, digestive system through something called the vagus nerve. Now, yeah. The vagus nerve runs uh, uh, runs down uh, and connects to all of these organs. But the other thing that it does is that it also feeds into your um, into your facial mu uh, muscles mm -hmm. because it's also used as a social nerve for responding and reacting to people, and then your physiological reactions respond accordingly. Yeah. Um, again, that's something more in depth, uh, which is another part of it. But the main thing that that, that it works with is that uh, your physiological responses um, are triggered by the vagus nerve, and the vagus nerve, because it links into the heart, the lungs, and the and the digestion, uh, and all of the other organs, it actually sig uh, it gets feedback from those organs but it also triggers a bunch of uh, hormonal reactions because of something that happens when you're in a danger situation which yeah. is why when you get a danger situation it's, it's almost immediately that you start reacting to it because of the the cortisol gets uh, dumped into your your system your adrenaline gets pumped up into your system and your um your your all your physiological responses then react to that. So your body then starts looking for energy, which is glycogen and emergency energy stores to provide you with that energy to deal with it with a danger yeah. scenario. So that's a bit of the the background on how um, the physiological responses work. Now, the, the only way that you can actually counter some of the fight or flight responses where you can calm it down is through breathing. Um, in controlling your breathing. That's the only way that you can actually control it or by changing your awareness a bit. But if you're yeah. in a really highly emotional situation, it's very difficult to override emotional uh, scenarios when you're in a situation and you're not used to it. Now, your comment is what I'm really interested in is how did you uh, develop that, you could say, response to override or control the fight or flight reaction and you know that physiological response what was the training that you went through to be able to manage that situation yeah so i think uh, I, I i don't necessarily think it can be can be nailed down as such and i think mm -hmm. it's just the, the 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 collective piece so 
throughout flying training, throughout any of those uh, training scenarios. So again, when we're talking, I'll refer again to high performance troops. So I think you know of the the with with the military you kind of the special forces tier you've also got the aviation tier as well where you are operating at potentially your the the performance of either yourself or the equipment that you've got mm -hmm. so we would operate flying wise at the absolute uh, limit of that aircraft so what what we do is we would drill um scenarios so any emergency scenarios are drilled and when i say they're drilled they are relentlessly drilled day in day out throughout training training being you know anywhere from certainly flying training for me was six years long um, and some of the other you know that's probably the longest training for pipeline some of the other kind of high performance people in the military are are slightly less but looking at myself six years long and you you have this scenario where you are drilled day in day out emergency situations what are you going to do in this scenario what are you going to do in that scenario so every time you fly the person sat next to you, the instructor while you're training will be simulating um uh, a scenario that's live kind of scenarios you also do it in the simulator mm -hmm. and it's that relentless drilling day in day out so then um i remember coming out of training and immediately effectively as i say going to to iraq for the war in iraq and there was zero change for me i literally and i remember having a mental thought actually the only difference here is it's 20 degrees hotter and everything is sandy but with regards to flying day in day out we everything seemed so familiar mm. so the scenarios where we were going into kind of dangerous landing sites where we were being shot at where things were happening that five months earlier was simula being simulated and now were being real my mental picture was exactly the same and it was down to that drilling day in day out and it was almost as if it conditions our brains or it conditions your brain yeah. or needs that response to enable you to immediately know what your reaction will be. So I was never waiting for a scenario, then seeing how I would react. I knew when that scenario happened exactly how I would react because I'd done it a thousand times before. And I guess it comes down to, you know, a lot of people say like the 10,000 hour piece, you know, you become an art, a master when you've done something 10,000 hours, you've done something that many times. And that's just the repetition. And I do believe that repet repetitive nature of simulating those high stress scenarios means that when that high stress scenario happens for real, you are desensitized to it. Okay. Mm. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting insight into it because I think the whole aspect of where you were talking about where you went from your training scenario, which was yeah. simulated and everything else. You could say you were, there's two things to it. One is a conditioned response yeah. and you become familiar to a conditioned response, yeah. which meant that you were not unfamiliar with it and you weren't looking for a solution to the problem because you yes. already were trained in how to manage the situation. All you had yeah. to do was then fit in whichever That's aspect it. of the training to actually get it, uh, get it solved. And I, and I think, I think where that falls back is the fact the, the the actual trained response as you say you are simply putting that piece of the jigsaw into the the actual scenario that's being presented in that time but what i feel it does do is it allows when you're talking about your heart response and your breathing response your uh it allows my heart rate my breathing would obviously it would change subtly but mm. certainly not enough to change your reaction because yes you simulate no matter how well you simulate it's still never the same as the real thing no uh, but what it allows you to do is immediately your heart rate doesn't change the same as it would had it not been simulated and your breathing doesn't speed up. Yeah. And I've certainly found that when I've done uh, certain high risk sports, shall we say, there is a your heart rate will I've always found my, my heart rate, my breathing will increase when you are approaching that moment of fear. So I did a lot of skydiving, you know, mm. and I still do now where your heart rate and your breathing will increase. But then there is a a mental switch of. I am familiar with this picture. I'm familiar with the environment. I'm familiar with what I'm going to do. And then I can immediately take control of my own breathing, my own heart rate, and then it's gone. Yeah. That, 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 that I've then I've taken control of that situation and I know exactly then what I will be doing. And I, I very, very much believe that comes from training. Mm -hmm. If I think back to kind of day one in training, when we were having scenarios thrown at us, I would freeze. Mm -hmm. So a scenario, I'd be putting a high pressure simulated situation, my fight or flight 
reflex would would freeze and I would know, not know what to do at all. And I would sit and it wasn't because I didn't know what to do. It's because my body wouldn't allow me to do it. Now, that's an interesting point. Um, while I was doing a lot of research into uh, the vagus nerve, I came across a, a researcher called Stephen Porges, and he's got a theory called the polyvagal theory, which is really interesting because everything that you've so far said fits into his, you could say, framework. Okay. And what he said is that you've got three stages of, you could say, the way that the body functions. The yep. first one is your, you could say, fight or flight, where you start having the stress responses and you react to that. Then what you do is that you go to a second stage where you become, you go into a lot more, you could say, stressed, uh, and you become a lot more withdrawn to protect yeah. yourself your body will get into almost a, a position where, where where it tries to deal with a scenario in a in an emergency scenario so you start reacting uh, yeah. kind of out of sorts they said and then you got the third stage which is almost the immobilization stage where yeah. you don't know what to do your body is completely it's like i don't know how to deal with it so the only other way that it deals with it is literally shuts down to protect yourself because then what happens is if you do nothing you'll be safe for now until something passes and then you start reacting or then you start almost like waking up and saying okay this is how i deal with it and that fits into what you said quite well because it's almost like you've gone through stages where it's like fight or flight okay i need to deal with it Second stage, yeah. I don't know how to deal with it. So your stress responses kick in. Yeah. And then it gets to a point where you don't know what to do. So the body is like, I'm going to do nothing. And it's because of the way that it works, it completely immobilizes your physiological responses and you can't do a thing, which is why yeah. a lot of people say, I, was, I, I don't know why I couldn't move. It's not because yeah. they couldn't move or they're not capable or there's any kind of mental failure with them. It's just the body's physiological response is that I'm going to keep you safe. And the only way that I know I can keep you safe is by you not moving. It will override everything that you want to do until it gets to a point where it feels it's safe for you to uh, react and then it will yeah. almost let go. And I said, that's how I've always known it. I've always known it in three stages, the fight, flight, or freeze. Yeah. Do you know where a lot of people refer to it, the fight or flight reflex, where for me, there's always, I've always understood it as, as a freeze element as well. Mm. So it is a case of, that is exactly as you say your body's such a high stress situation doesn't know what you could do and it's not that you don't know what to do it's you physically can't do it yeah and that's where the training kicks in quite effectively because yeah. what you do over a period of time is that you're conditioning your body to the situation and you condition conditioning your mental processes on how to deal with it so instead of triggering a lot of these uh, these these fear of uh, fight or flight and uh, freeze responses yeah. you actually get to a point where it's like i am familiar with this situation which means you can start dealing with it and the other thing that it it does is that your range of coping mechanisms increases because of the training and the scenarios that you put yourself through which yes. means that your capacity for dealing with high stress situations is wider because of you could say the scenarios that you put yourself through, which is why training is so vitally important to give you that mm. capacity to deal with it. Yeah. I think something else as well we become um, is, is kind of the emotional side comes into it as well. So yeah. when people say, you know, it is a lot of fear, but also there's, I think there's fear, you know, again, when you look at different scenarios. So people will, for instance, if it is a trauma situation with, say, themselves, a child, a loved one, their reaction there maybe to freeze or to um to you know and i've seen that certainly when i when i flew search and rescue helicopters you'd see people's reaction differ on trauma situations to say loved ones um of what they would do and it was quite an interesting thing to see how people would behave and the majority of it was freeze mm -hmm. because they they saw somebody that they loved and cared for in pain have an accident whatever and we would turn up and would say have you kept them warm have you done this and they said no 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 i just can't move i don't know what to do i don't know what to touch them because the, their their the emotions are almost have kicked in as well mm -hmm. so the emotional side is gone and coupled with the freeze element um th they can do nothing and i think being able to draw 
so I feel I a lot of people, you know, I, I kind of say certainly in the, the job I'm doing now, you've got to remove emotions from a lot of decisions that you make. Um, and the ability to do that, again, just comes from, for me, I, I put it down to kind of training and that drilling. I am able to look at a scenario and have no emotion whatsoever to that scenario and know exactly how my body will react. But there's no emotional tie, there's no emotional attachment to that whatsoever, even if it is a, a very close relative, a family member. And I've had those scenarios, but I'm able to do that. But I guess that's 20 years of military drilling mm. yeah but I think yeah that's a that that's a a conditioned response because yeah. you've got to override your your yes. natural tendency um so the interesting question with that regard is at what point did you actually get to that and how did you start realizing that you could actually reduce the emotional impact on your decision making so um as part of, you do a lot of um, what's called resistance to interrogation training whenever you will deploy into a, a frontline role. So certain certain elements of the military receive resistance to interrogation training mm -hmm. where you effectively are interrogated for a period of time. You are, it's called the conditioning phase. So you are conditioned initially. So for me, it was 10 days worth of conditioning where you are on an exercise, on a military exercise, you're, you're conditioned. You have minimal sleep, minimal food, and you are what's called on the run. So your body is drained and depleted. And what happens there is the, the mind almost plays games on you. At the end of that period of exercise, you are simulated that you are caught and you are put through a, 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 an element of resistance to interrogation. Now, the first time you do that, your emotions take over. You have, because you are, your body's depleted, you are, mm. And effectively, the way they do it is they'll teach you about it. They will then put you in the scenario and show you how your emotions take over. And your emotions take over completely. Now, following that, there's a period of time of recovery. You look back at kind of debriefs, video debriefs. You see the uh, the response your body's had. And I think it's being able to see how you responded to that situation in the cold light of day enables you to then change the response afterwards so we would then do a resistance to interrogation again and it would be a zero emotional and that for me was the ability was kind of the switch in my head that said i know exactly what i need to do in my own body to turn off my emotions in that scenario it's a very it's a very interesting thing yeah that's that ties into uh something else if you go from uh the the brain processes because what you've got over there is that you've got a feedback loop which yeah. is built into the training process if you had to go through the process and you don't get any feedback you don't know what you need to change I and mean, yeah that's that's part of the the vital learning uh, process is to have that feedback and the other really important thing is if you can, can actually see your reactions now what you're doing is that you self assessing yeah self-assessing and then yeah. up changing your you know so i could immediately see that as you say the feedback loop and again that's the feedback loop is something again we would do religiously with when it comes to flying is a feedback loop you would always brief a scenario carry out the scenario debrief the scenario in order to offer feedback for the following and that that feed, so we talk quite a lot about feedback loops and um with response to that not mentally as such that you know physically that's the feedback loop that we are doing in order to then improve and change um, it's an interesting one when, when i say about like another kind of resistance to interrogation training that is another one where the fight flight or freeze reflex comes in so yeah. it's it's that even though it again simulated where you, you are going to be caught and that immediate you are about to be caught there's loud noises there's you know the amount of people some people will so i think of the people who were in my team there was somebody who literally stood still absolutely froze I personally ran and I didn't know why. And another fella turned and started to fight the people who were. So it, it was a it was an absolute perfect illustration of the three responses that could have happened. And, yeah. and you know, we were a team of four people and out of the four of us, two of us ran, one of us fought, one of us genuinely stood still. And it was an absolute there was no thought went into that. It was an immediate boom, I'm running. Yeah. Do you know so that was where my brain took me. The other fella turned around and he charged at the people who were about to catch and it was a you know that it was a, a a direct illustration of the three 
stages as such. Yeah, there's uh, coming back to your uh, flying training and your uh, debriefs and the feedback loops. It also comes into a really interesting book that I read called the Checklist Manifesto. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure if you've read it yet. Not read that exact book, but very very similar. I can imagine the sort of the, the, the things it talks about. Yeah. yeah. So basically, what they've done is, I used to work for um, EasyJet, so I'm I, I dealt with a lot of you could say the pilots and the crew, and one of the things that they obviously did is with their uh, with their daily checks is they they always had their checklist that they work through and even with pilots when they get get ready to fly they've got a checklist that they go through and it's yeah. a very strict um you could say blow by blow step that they've got to, got to go through before they actually take off they got to they do all the the aircraft checks they do all the instrumental checks they do all the process checks to make sure that by the time that they actually fly in they're not ha- they don't have that mental overload or or, or, or worry no. about something's not being done because they've already gone through the whole list and they've verified everything is working, which means it reduces your mental capacity of having to worry about something because you've gone through the process of checking it. Yes. And yes. that's that's a really interesting aspect of it, which, which helps when you go through this, you almost say procedural checklist of having to deal with something, you remove a lot of the mental, you could say, feedback or continual loop that you get stuck in sometimes when you're in a in a negative situation. Yes, yeah, yeah, in, yeah, no, and absolutely, and very, very similar. But it's um, the the drilling and the checklist, and I guess like when I refer to drilling, that's exactly it is. It is that checklist, you know, yeah. that the learn verbatim the this response will follow that response, and we're very much trained that if at any point something will interrupt that checklist you start again. Yeah. So you may be going to check one, two, three, four, at check four, something may interrupt you. You don't go back in at check four and carry on four, five, six, seven. You will start again, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So the checklist, once you have started it, you will complete it. Oh, if there interesting. Is, yeah, so if there is an inter- inter- interruption, you should really refer. Your experience kind of kicks in, shall we say. Um, experience kind of kicks in and... Uh, sometimes you can jump back in, but certainly when you're trained, you are trained. If a checklist is started, it will be finished. If there is an interruption, then you will start again until you finish it. What's what's the reason for restarting from from the beginning? It's more where you come back into the loop, the or come back into the checklist. So the 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 thinking is, and again, it's kind of comes back. To, there's a lot of talk about cognitive failure, yeah, and we are say what you see rather than and again, it's when you do checklists aviation wise, it may be switch on, this switch on, that switch off, this switch off. You know, there may be the sequences. And the worry is if you step out midway, you may miss the step that you've, for instance, say you step out of check number four. Have you done check number four or did, is that when the interruption happened, but you haven't yet done check four? Okay. Did you finish check four and you go, do you know, so it's, it's to ensure that the what the where the interruption happened, that check has been done. Because the worry is, say you do one, two, three, interruption happens at four, but you haven't done four yet. You step out, you come back in, and you think, right, I got interrupted at check four. I'm going to go back in at check five, six, seven, eight. But four was never done. And so that's it, where potential and error can creep in, and something exactly. fatal can happen. And we have a lot of cognitive failures where. Quite often when you do them repetitive, you will say the right response, but you haven't looked at what the actual um, thing is. So, for instance, our checklist may be um, this switch on, on, that switch on, that one off, that one on. And you will, when you do a checklist, you you actually verbalize it. So you will say on, on, do. Yeah. And, but a lot of them, uh, we find that you, the, the switches, for instance, are never on or off, but you'll Seeing what you expect, yeah, but you're never checking. So that comes down to yeah, so it's, expectation it's instead of verification, and those can cause problems. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Now that was that's really interesting, Rich. Yeah. I I know you've got a another appointment uh, that you've got to uh, go to today but thank you very much for for the interview it was really interesting and i'd love to have you on again sometime
Absolutely, Lance. I'm sorry it, it dragged on. This presentation was thrown at me yesterday, and I thought, do you know what? That's I could probably juggle them both. Um, but hopefully, I've still given a, a enough value there in the in the half hour we've had, and I'm more than happy to come on again if you want to want to expand the chat. By all means, just just let me know and let's organise something else. That sounds good. Excellent. Have a good day. Having you too. Bye bye now. Take care.